Excellent. Here we are. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Good morning, everybody. I know it's an early morning session, but it'll be, you know, I put in jokes to make it, uh, you know, to make it a little more palatable for everybody. I think it'll be a lot nicer if we all just, hi, oh, thank you very much in the back. I don't know if you were waving at me or waving at someone else, but I'm just going to say you were, you were waving at me. I'm just going to... Uh, uh, just going to say that. Okay, this is Git with the program. It's basic concepts in Git. In fact, we probably won't even get into a ton of code. We're just going to kind of talk through wrapping our minds around uh, the basic the basics of version control in Git. So a couple things just to get me started so that I know who I'm talking to. Uh, who has some experience with Git? Great. Who has absolutely no experience with Git? Uh, all right. Uh, of the no experience with Git, Raise your hand if you have experience with some other form of version control like Subversion or CVS. Couple of you. Okay, couple switchers. Great. It's good to know because it's, uh, um, it's a little tough to switch sometimes. Um, the, uh, well, this, you know, they promised us these iPhones would be easy, but, but not so, I guess, with the keynote presenter stuff. Um, super, uh, well, let's, let's dig in. Um, of the people who are, are here with Git, who's, uh, who would say that they are, uh, just starting out beginning? Okay. Uh, anyone who's an intermediate, uh, anyone who's an, okay, good. And anyone who's an expert who should be giving this talk instead of me. You are excellent. You want to come up and take the podium? Um, well, first of all, about me, uh, I'm Matt. Uh, I'm a freelance web generalist. I've been writing web pages by hand in 1997 and have been building websites since then. Uh, my business is called Rather Creative, and my terrible website is up at rathercreative.com, uh, the, the cobbler's children and, and whatnot. Um, I'm a web generalist, so I do, or a full stack developer, so I do everything from consulting, information architecture, and all, all that through development, through front end engineering, through deployment, sysadmin. Um, pretty much being a one-man shop. Uh, I've been working on Drupal since 4.6. I got brought in with the, the Civic Space project, which was a port of Howard Dean's campaign website. Uh, he used Drupal as kind of the first guy to sort of leverage open source technology to, to kind of, you know, uh, use in, in the political realm. And uh, if you're interested, I'm most definitely available for work. And uh, my awesome phone number is 510 Rather. That's my last name. Um, so I have a lot of uh, information and a lot of slides, but I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge some of my sources. Uh, one is a great talk by Merlin himself, Randall Schwartz, uh, who you may know as the host of the Floss Weekly podcast on the Twit Network, uh, and who I know as an awesome drinking buddy and an all-around nice guy. Um, he gave a great talk at Media Temple in Culver City about Git. It's a little more technical than we're going to get today, but um, you know it's worth uh, it's worth looking at as kind of a next step. And uh, by the way, I'll make these slides available, so don't worry about writing down these short URLs. Uh, and then his slides, uh, which go into a great deal uh, more detail about the kind of internal uh, workings of Git, are available on SlideShare. And then the book that I learned and that everyone else learned Git out of. Uh, is called ProGit, uh, and it's available for free on the uh, on the Git website, which is git-scm. SCM is for Source Control Management. dot com uh, slash book. Easy URL. Um, it's a it's a good read, and though it is though it is technical, it takes you through. Uh, and uh, you can use this. Let me Google that for you. Link that I've provided uh, here if you would like more uh, Git tutorials. Both of the, the things are Creative Commons license, as, as is my talk. So you know, if you find it useful and want to share with other people, please feel free. Um, today, first of all, why version control? Um, though judging from the number of people who have their hands up for Git, um, uh, for having some experience with Git, uh, I don't think I'm going to have to make that case. Uh, we'll talk about Git basic concepts. And in, in any time that remains to us, we may demo, uh, do some demo, though I'm not sure that we will have time for that. Oh, usually it takes people an hour to hate me and everything I stand for. Uh, and I'll do, we'll do time for questions after each section. So, so because there's a great deal of material, we'll never get through it if you shout out in the middle, but I have a question slide after each one so that we can kind of deal with questions 
as they uh, as they come up. So first, let me make the case. Uh, let me make the case to you for version control if I if I need that. So uh, that was one of the funny jokes that I have embedded in this morning's talk. So that you know the the 10 a.m. time and the the drive and the lack of coffee don't get to you. I'm going to try it again, and you can you know chortle appreciatively. Yeah, let's go. So let's dive in. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I'll be here all week. Uh, tip your waitress and try the veal. I hear it's divine. Um, so who does not use any kind of version control uh, in your work? None. Absolutely. Okay. Keep them up. Raise them <laughs> in your coding, in your website development work. Uh, raise your hands and be shamed by your friends. Uh, of you who have your hands up, who thinks they shouldn't? Who thinks that this whole version control thing is not for them? Oh, good. I'm glad to, I'm glad to hear that, right? Sometimes you hear people say things like, oh, I'm just working on a little script. It's only for me. No one's going to ever see it. It's just for a personal project. I'm never going to use it again. I don't need version control. I just save the file when I'm done with it, right? Uh, it's easy and finished. It will never be updated. I never make mistakes. I never change my mind. And the world is never going to change. And so I don't need version control, right? Um, before, uh, before I was using version control, I would develop locally. And before that, I would FTP into a live site and make changes uh, via SFTP on a live site. We all agree that this is a terrible idea, right? Nod your head yes. Yeah, it's awful. Um, so we develop locally, and then we use FTP to deploy, right? Or SFTP or rsync or whatever, what have you, to deploy. And everything is on our, our server, well, on our local server. Well. Good, but have you ever saved a change late in night and then wanted to revert it the next morning in the clear light of day once you've realized you've made a terrible mistake but you've closed your IDE and you've junked the entire undo stack and you can't get to the point where you were and you've wiped out two hours of work in one little delete key? You know, have you ever wanted to check your progress and see how far you've come on a project? Do you ever forget to make a backup? Who Have you ever forgotten to make a backup? Have you ever remembered to make a backup, gone to your backup, and realized that it was corrupted, or it didn't run right, or the magnetic hard drive crashed, which has happened to me multiple times, actual physical crashing of the read-write head on the platter, right? Um, have you ever had to work on two things at once? Have you ever had to implement two features in, this, in the same time in a website? Uh, which is another way of saying, have you ever had a boss? Right, who comes over to you and tell you to drop whatever you're doing, leave it in its unfinished state. Well, without version control, that, that unfinished code stays in the code base. Um, have you ever wanted to in, use code in multiple projects and uh, incorporate the updates from one project into another easily and automatically? And this is before you even factor in a team of people. I'm going to skip the questions on this slide because it seems like you guys are pretty hit, hip to version control. So let's talk about Git. Git is a version control system. Git takes a snapshot of your work at a particular time, saves it, lets you work some more, take another snapshot, lets you work some more, take another snapshot, let you work some more, take another snapshot, and you have a chain of these that represent the history of your work on a project. So Git tracks a tree of files over time, and that's important. It's a tree of files. Uh, that are related to one another in a project. Uh, Git is distributed, uh, every which means, and there's a little misunderstanding about this, it doesn't uh, mean that there's no central server, right? Anyone who's used GitHub has used a central server. It means that your copy of the repository is complete unto itself. Uh, it means that you can do everything, look back through history, um, work, uh, add commits, complete unto itself. Git is high performance. Git is used by the Linux kernel. It was actually developed to work on the Linux kernel. Uh, it's used on the Drupal project. So it has to be able to perform complex operations on large amounts of code uh, very, very quickly. For the same reason, uh, it has to be able to store data efficiently. Um, branches, uh, that is to say, alternative chains of commits are easy to create and destroy. It's very easy to try things. Uh, this is 
set against Subversion or CVS, where when you branch, you end up making a whole copy of the entire code base. You end up transmitting that over the internet, and it takes for freaking ever. Uh, so, you know, uh, this is definitely an improvement. Um, Git has good data integrity. It's robust and safe. It will warn you before you do something stupid. You still can do the stupid thing, but you will have been warned and have nobody to blame, uh, nobody to blame but yourself. And it has, it's collaborative. It has a great deal of uh, good features for, uh, a great many good features, I should say, uh, for teams working together in a variety of ways. Git is not for tracking individual unrelated files. Does anyone, does anyone put their Etsy directory, their slash Etsy directory in version control just to track changes to that? No? Okay, some people do. Git is not a good tool for that, right? Because if you imagine the configuration files in your Etsy directory, when you make changes to one, say you're making changes to the Apache web server files, you don't want to check in the whole Etsy directory because of a change to one file. And then when you configure postfix, you don't want to check in the Apache files and, and stuff like that. Those files aren't related to each other, and they have separate histories more to the point. So uh, if you want to put your Etsy in, into some kind of revision control system, you can just use RCS. You can use the old, 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 old one, and that might be, uh, that might be better. Git is not for tracking file metadata, uh, even really file names to a certain extent, um, but definitely permissions, ownership, created on dates, the, you know, the file system timestamp as distinct from the commit timestamp, right? You, you track the time and date that you made a particular commit to your repository, but you generally don't track the time that a file was created on your computer. No one needs to know that you did it at three in the morning, you know, alone. Uh, that's, that's not there. And likewise, permissions. Git is for source, source code files. Um, so the idea of source code is that they're all pretty much accessible and permissions come into play uh, at, a different, at a different level. Now, there are plugins that can do all of these things. There are plugins that can deal with, uh, with permissions and, and uh, stuff like that. Um, it's kind of not the point, but if that's important to your use case, if, for example, you deploy straight from Git and need a certain, uh, need a certain set of permissions on your web server, you can get that. Um, and Git is not really for binary files. The idea of source control is that you can run diffs, right, on your deltas. You can look at what's changed. Uh, and on a binary file, that's not really relevant. I mean, do you care that a series of ones and zeros has been changed to another series of ones and zeros? Of course you care, but you can't do anything really actionable with that. Uh, with that information. The idea is that the representation of a thing in a source code file is the same as the thing itself. A line of code is a line of code is a line of code and you can run run uh, diffs on that. Um, or as uh, as Randall Schwartz put it uh, once to me, if you have a uh, if you have a two branches with different copies of a file called photo.jpg and one is a picture of a vase and one is a picture of a flower, running git merge does not put the flower in the vase. So if you are coming from other uh, version control systems, um, we need you to wrap your mind around a couple things. One is the distributed nature of Git, that your repository is complete unto itself. Anyone can commit, asterisk, to their own repository. Uh, you can commit to the repository that is local on your computer. It's complete unto itself. You can do all the work you want in there, create uh, history, and uh, commit it to the repository. Once you start fetching and pushing and uh, work to a remote repository, permissions come into play. But within the privacy of your own computer, no one can see you but the NSA. <laughs> Now, there still can be a central kind of blessed uh, repo that we know is good. This is the case for the Drupal project, for example. It's, you know, only a few people commit to it. Um, I mean, Drupal has a patch-based workflow, so it's, it's a little different than, like, 
uh, you know, dev shop Git projects, but um, there is a, a Drupal Git repository. And if you try to do a lot of work on the Drupal core and you try to push to the Drupal Git repository, you can't. Uh, and that is as it should be. Um, there is a central blessed repo. That doesn't mean your repository still isn't complete unto itself uh, insofar as it goes. And um, universal public identifiers or uh, SHA-1 hashes are something that, that you kind of need to get your mind around. Um, Git represents everything internally to itself as a SHA-1 hash. So what is a SHA-1 hash? Well, unfortunately, no one can be told what a SHA-1 hash is. You just have to find out for yourself. Little matrix joke? No? Guess not. Uh, SHA-1 hash is a 40 char is a 40 character, that is to say a 20 byte um, checksum, uh, cryptographic hash of some data. You plug some data into the SHA-1 function and it returns a, uh, a unique 40 character um, a unique 40 character string, hexadecimal string like that. Every object in Git, every object in Git, not just commits, Every object in Git is hashed and has a SHA-1 uh, that represents it internally. And Git is so fast because it does everything it can only to deal with the SHA-1s and never to touch the data unless it has to. When you create a branch, you're only creating a thing that you're only creating a little file that that points at a SHA-1. It's 21 bytes. It's a, it's a, you know 40 characters in a new line, right? Um, so, okay, if every object in Git has this 40-character uh, string that represents it, there are only so many 40-character strings possible in the world. Um, what if one is the same? Shh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. Uh, the heat death of the universe will happen before there is a SHA-1 collision in your Git repository. And, uh, by the way, there is internal plumbing in Git to deal with SHA-1 collisions if they ever occur, which they won't. Um, another thing is that when you talk in Git about SHA-1s, you can abbreviate them. You only have to use as many characters as you have to be unique. So say you have a very small repo, you might be able to refer to the SHA-1 that's highlighted up on the screen just as 6 or 6BC or 6... BCB34, or just as many characters as you need uh, to, to uniquely identify it uh, from all the other SHA ones that Git is talking about. Um, and this is, this is so useful that in the Linux kernel, in the entire history of the Linux kernel that is in Git, you can uniquely identify a commit with, I think, only seven characters at this point. Okay, so every object in Git gets a SHA-1. So what's an object? three kinds of objects. Uh, the first kind of object is a tree. Uh, oh, sorry, is a blob. Sorry, blob, which is Git's term for actual data. It abstracts that into the, into the idea of a blob. It's not a file. It's not a anything. It's a blob. And Git deals with blobs, and it hashes them, and they, they have shell ones. Uh, a tree is a directory of a of blobs or of other trees, so that you can have subdirectories and subdirectories, and your whole file system can be represented in this uh, in this schema, or a commit. And a commit is an object that has pointers to three things. One is a tree, the current state of the world, the current state of your working directory at the time that you make the commit. Zero or more parent commits, normally one. Right when you commit, there's one parent commit that's the immediate predecessor of the commit that you're making at your very first commit, it will be zero uh, because there, it will be the beginning of the history of the world. There's no commits before it. And if you're merging branches together, there will be uh, more than one parent commit, two or more usually. Um, a tree, pointers to the parent commits, and uh, metadata, which includes a little, a little message from you saying what you worked on, uh, your name, your email, a timestamp saying what date and time it was. So it looks like this. We have a commit. And you can see that uh, on the slide, there's a little uh, abbreviated SHA-1 above the commit. That would be, you know, imagine that that is the SHA-1 of this commit. The commit points to a tree. That tree has three blobs in it. 
Uh, in this case, I think they're meant to be a license file, a Ruby file, and a test file. Uh, oh yeah, there you go. Or a readme file, a license file, and a, a test.rb file. And then each of those blobs is hashed, is hashed down. Um, and you can see, no, you don't see it pointing to, to a parent commit. But this commit would also point, if it weren't the first in the repository, it would point to its parent commit. So a commit points to its parent, that commit points to its parent, that commit points to its parent, all the way to the beginning of the history of the universe. Does that make sense? Not, help me out here, nod your head if this makes sense, because this gets a little heady, yeah? So the SHA-1 of that commit, of whatever commit you're on, depends on everything that has come before, everything, because of the, the recursive going up the chain in the parent commits. Each of those was hashed, and the next commit depends on that hash to calculate its hash. Yeah? Nod your head yes, if that makes sense. Good. Okay. So a SHA-1 represents not just... The SHA-1 of a commit represents... Uh, not just a commit, but the entire history of the universe at that point. When I say history of the universe, I mean your repository. If anything had been different anywhere up the chain, if there was some different data, if there was a different uh, commit message, if uh, any, any commits are in someone else's history that aren't in yours, the SHA-1 will be different. So you can think of the entire repository, or the history, or the state of the repository, including its history, as a single SHA-1 hash, a single 40-character hexadecimal number. And, by the way, if you're working with other people, and you have a repository, and they have a repository, and you have commits with the same hexadecimal number, the same SHA-1 hash, you are guaranteed that you are talking about not only the same commit, not only the same... Uh, set of deltas on this particular work item, but also the same history of the world back to the beginning of the repository. See why that is so cool? Why that makes it possible to collaborate, um, uh, to collaborate with people? So, okay, we need to talk about commitment. I feel like it's been 20 minutes, you know, it's time for us to have that conversation. Um, Git has uh, three stages in its workflow. One is that you work. Two is that you stage your work for commit. And three is that you commit. So you can do a lot of work in your code base. But what you, uh, what you do before you commit is select from all the files you've changed which changes you want to put into the next commit. So it's not just, okay, take my whole tree, everything I've changed, put in. You can, so, uh, you can and you should... Uh, select what's going in. Um, yes, you should select what's going in because it, it makes it, it's, it's a good practice to have small logical commits. Uh, so you do these things here. You work in the file system, you stage in a staging area that Git has, and you commit to the repository. Or in Git talk, you work in the working tree you commit to what Git calls the index. The staging area is called the index. And you commit to head. Head, H-E-A-D, all capital letters, is Git's term and always means the spot where your commit is going to go on top of if you were to commit. And it can change locations. If you change branches, head moves to the new branch that you're on because your commits are now going to be stacked on top of that branch. So head is not what you think of from CB CVS or Subversion. Um, just get that out of your mind entirely. It bears no relation to, uh, to what it means in Git. Uh, head, H-E-A-D, all capital letters, is a pointer that says, my commit is going to go here. So we do these things by writing code using the command git add and using the command git commit. Work, git add, git commit. Work, git add, git commit. Rinse and repeat. Over and over and over and over. You know what, actually we should, we should pause here and talk a little bit about, uh, we should pause here and talk a little bit uh, about questions because, well, we started late, but
Yeah. So questions at this point? Not in different, not in different heads. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry to jump on that, but I want to be super precise with the terminology. Yeah, I, I want to be super precise with the terminology because I don't want, uh, I, I don't want to be responsible for any disasters down the line. But yes, when you're, when I think it's a good practice, and we'll actually, I'll actually talk about this in a second when I talk about branches. I think it's a good practice when you're implementing a feature to create a topic branch for that feature. And, uh, and work on that rather than working on the main line of your repository. Because features sometimes aren't done, sometimes you have to ab abandon one, sometimes you have to uh, work on more than one at once, and you don't necessarily want that commit in the mainline history of your project. So you want to merge that in when it's ready, right? When it comes out of the oven. So yes, many, many branches, and Git makes it easy to create arbitrarily many. So, okay, fine. Uh, no questions, we'll talk about branches. So here's a, here's a little fact pattern. There's a chain of commits. Uh, what is a branch, right? I mean, it's a chain of commits, and that's our branch, sort of. In fact, in Git, a branch is a pointer. It's not the whole chain. The branch in Git is a pointer to a SHA-1 hash that references a commit. So in this case, it might be tempting to say the master branch has three commits. Not so. The master branch is a pointer, is a reference to F30AB. Yeah? Um, and this sets it apart from other version control systems where your branch is a complete co copy of the repository. Um, now you can have an arbitrary number of branches pointing at any different commits in your history. Uh, they're cheap and fast to create and destroy, so go branch crazy. Um, one is usually called master, and if you create a new repository using the command git init, it will set you up with a branch called master. Excuse me, but there's nothing special about that word. Uh, you can delete master and use whatever uh, you can ever, uh, whatever you want. You're always working on the tip of a branch in your repo. That is to say, when you're on master, you're, you're always, and, and there I was, I was, uh, I was bad with the terminology. Um, you're always working on the tip of a chain of commits. So if we're working on master, that means head is pointed at master, which is pointed at F30AB. Um, there's something called detached head mode, and uh, there's a command git reset that lets you kind of change where, master, where branches are pointed, but I think they're probably beyond the scope of a beginner focus talk. Um, and so when you commit uh, onto master, master moves to your new commit, and the former commit that master was pointing at becomes the parent, like so. Yeah? Uh, the git commit command produces this state of the world. OK, so let's create a new branch. Uh, git branch testing, the command. And it creates a branch called testing that points uh, to the place where we're at which also happens to be the same place that master is at, in this case. Um, now, we've just created the branch. We haven't switched to it yet. So head is still pointing at master. Uh, even after our git branch testing command, head is still pointed at master. If we want to start doing some work on the testing branch and start moving that testing pointer forward, but leaving the master pointer where it is, git checkout testing. Is the, uh, is the command that we want, which will move the head pointer to, um, uh, to point at testing, which is pointing at F30AB. So let's talk about why we do this. Um, say we wanted to try something out, right? And we, we add a commit to the, testing, uh, to the testing branch. The testing branch moves forward. The former place it was pointing uh, becomes the parent. And we wanted to try out this code in our repository. Now we can secure, we can easily, we can always move back to, uh, to a previous commit, but now we can easily move back because we have the master pointer uh, pointed at it. It's safe. Um, if we decide that we don't like the world uh, that we have now, we can easily get back to F30AB. Uh, do you remember F30AB? It was truly a simpler and better time. Yeah. Um, 
and and uh, we have that secure. So we can get checkout master, go back to master, and hey, you know what? We get a hot fix now for our website. Oh no, there's a security problem. We need to you know, we need you to address it right away in the production code. So we can commit to master like this, and now we have parallel histories, right? Now they've diverged. Now the master pointer has its own commit referencing the same parent that the testing uh, branch references, but um, having, uh, having a different work, a different set of deltas, a different set of changes in it. Um, so imagine this state of the world. We have our production code on master. Uh, boss tells us to work on issue five, uh, issue 53 from the bug tracker, so we're going to check out a branch called ISS 53. Git checkout, flag B, ISS 53 is a shortcut to do both of those things. Create the branch and check it out. Uh, at the same time, a little shortcut syntax. So, uh, great, we do a little work on issue 53. Super, makes sense so far, yeah. Uh-oh, security problem, hot fix. Okay, we know how to do this. Get checkout master, get checkout B hot fix, do some work, get commit onto hot fix. All right, and now we have master representing our production code. Hot fix representing let's let's say a security fix and issue fifty three representing potentially unfinished work on some work that we've been doing. So two kinds of merges in Git, right? When we bring branches together, uh, they're called fast forward merge and recursive merge. So uh, let's talk about merging hot fix into master. Git checkout master, we're familiar with that, and then Git merge. Hotfix. Merge the work on Hotfix into the branch that I'm on is the force of that. Um, and you always, the order of these is important, right? We wouldn't get checkout the Hotfix, get merge master, A, because master is behind Hotfix in this scenario, and that is so it doesn't really mean anything. And also because it's important that you always check out the mainstream branch and merge in the topic branch. Uh, for, for the case of multiple parent commits, uh, that becomes important for history. So that produces this state of the world. It just fast forwards master to where hotfix is. Yeah? Does that make sense for everybody? Anyone who, does, who it doesn't make sense for, it's okay. No? Okay. Fast forward merge. The easiest kind of merge, it produces a serial history. That is to say, one line of history, uh, single parent for all of those commits. Um, and now we can safely delete the hotfix branch because we don't need it anymore. Get branch D hotfix removes the hotfix pointer. We don't need it anymore. Let's talk about recursive merging. Remember our issue 53 branch? So we've merged in our uh, we've merged in our hotfix changes, but now we're going back to issue fifty three. We're going to do a little work on that, um, and you can imagine the the and now we want to merge our issue fifty three branch uh, into master because this feature is done now. Get checkout master. Get merge issue fifty three. Uh, issue fifty three. Yeah, ISS five three uh, makes sense. That's the pattern we know. Well, let's try that command and see what happens. Uh, this is what happens. So this is called a recursive merge. That is to say, git will track back to the best ancestor commit of both branches, the, be the best commit it can find that both of those branches have in common, and it will re try to uh, then it will fast forward to the end of master and try to uh, try to apply the deltas from all three of those commits, C3, C4, and C5, into a new commit, which it will call C6, and it will put the master pointer there because we merged issue 53 into master. A recursive merge because it goes back in the history and then tries to reapply the changes that we've had. Um, super. And we could delete issue 53 at this point, git branch dash D issue 53, because we don't need it anymore. We don't need that pointer. We probably don't want to go back to the state of the world at C5 uh, up here. We're probably good to continue going on from C6. Uh, yeah? So when you do that, you get rid 
you know, the thing about C4 is you have to store it safely because the second you put a blasting cap, no, I'm teasing. Um, so the question is, I'm saying this for the recording, the question is what, what happens to C4 in this, in this scenario? No, uh, it doesn't. Remember, remember C4 represented our security hotfix, right? You with me? Yeah, so we want that, we want C3, and we want C5. And C6 contains the work from C3, C4, and C5. Does that make sense? Tell me if it doesn't. Okay, good. And we can delete issue 53, which has no effect on any commit in our repository. All the commits stay where they are. What we're doing is getting rid of the convenience pointer to C5. This creates a parallel history, right? And this is, I think, the thing that you're getting at. That is to say, one track of the history progresses from C2 to C4 to C6, and another from C2 to C3 to C5 to C6. So we have two tracks on our history, and they're both being integrated. Both tracks are being kind of joined together into this, into this merge commit. Um, totally fine. Great way to do it. Sometimes people don't like this because it can get messy, especially in large projects when you have many, 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 many branches going on at the same time. You can imagine six or seven or 20 tracks branching off and uh, needing to be merged together. Uh, so maybe we want to take our, um, maybe we want to take our uh, commit and, and um, somehow create a serial history, just a straight line history out of it. Well, we get a, uh, we get uh, that in Git with a command called rebase, git rebase. So here's what rebasing does. Suppose we, uh, suppose we were working along C0, C1, and C2, um, and we check out a branch called experiment to start working on an experiment with our code base. Um, and in the meantime, we go back to master and we do some work on master also. Well, we could merge them together like so. We know how to do that, right? Get checkout master, get merge experiment. At this point, the experiment branch can be deleted. We have a recursive merge. We have a parallel history. But that's ugly, right? That little, that little wart coming off, of the, coming off of our history like that. So what we can do is rewrite history. Get checkout experiment. Experiment, uh, go to the experiment branch, and uh, let's do some work using the experiment branch. Git rebase master. Now this is just the worst command in the world because you have to imagine the words on top of in the middle of rebase and master. I'm on the experiment branch. Git rebase on top of master. That is to say, if you can, Try to go back to my best ancestor with master, in, in this case, C2. Then go to the end of master and rewrite history as though I had done all of my work right after, uh, right after C4. This is kind of a mind bender, I know. But uh, you, are rewrite, you can rewrite history in this way so that your commits appear to apply uh, cleanly on top of uh, on top of the tip of whatever branch you are rebasing on top of git rebase on top of master. So you are rewriting history. You are literally changing history. This commit C3 prime up here will have a different SHA than the original C3. Why? Because it has a different parent commit. So it's no longer the same thing. It's just something that Git has allowed us to do. Uh, for the convenience of having a very uh, of having a very clean merge, and then we can get checkout master, get merge experiment, and get will perform a fast forward merge, moving the master pointer up to C three prime, uh, and then uh, we will have a state of the world that is a nice linear uh, nice linear history. This is dangerous. Rewriting history is dangerous when you are sharing your work with other people. So this leads me to the first commandment of Git rebasing. Take it away, Charlton. Thou shalt not, oh, and that's Charlton Heston, not Chris Charlton, by the way. Thou shalt not rebase commits that you have pushed to a remote repository. 
if you have shared your work with other people, get rebases off the table to you. Your integration manager, someone like me, will come and yell at you and make you cry. So, okay, I've mentioned remote repositories now. The genie is out of the bottle with that one. We don't just do the work on our, on our own machine. And because of time, yeah. Charlton, I'm gonna put Charlton back up on the screen. I like him so much. So, so remember, remember when I said that Git has data great data integrity and will tell you if you're doing something stupid? It will tell you if you're doing something stupid. So when you merge or when you rebase, there will be uh, a big warning for you that says merge conflicts or rebase conflicts detected and will give you a block of instructions for what to do. Um, basically what it will do is in the source code file, it will put both versions in, in a big block that says like, uh, uh, you know, master was at this, experiment was at this, and it'll be one of these conflict blocks that you're used to that's like eight angle brackets and then a branch name, a bunch, then a bunch of equal signs, then a bunch, and then, you know, eight angle brackets and stuff like that. You go, you find all of those that are a problem, fix them, get add, get commit, and it will finish, it'll finish the merge or the rebase uh, from where you from where you started, because we're not working uh, we're not working on actual code, and this was just kind of a high level conceptual uh, talk. I don't actually have slides for this, but in this case, Git status is always your is your best friend. In fact, run Git status three times before you even think of doing anything, and then run it again. Yeah, because it will say you are in the middle of a conflicted merge. Don't do anything. You know, fix this first and then go back. You can also git merge ab dash dash abort, which will take you out of the merge so that you can go have a cup of coffee and rethink your life choices. Okay? Excellent. Um, Charlton, one more time. Thou shalt not. Um, you want me to push through remote repositories or you want me to take questions now and wrap on time? Go. Push through. Okay, um, all these things that we've been talking about so far happen in the privacy of your own computer and don't affect anything else. But you can track what's going on in remote repositories, like the repositories on Beanstalk or GitHub or, you know, Bitbucket or what have you, or a private Git server that someone in your organization is running or you are running. Um, you can track these things by adding them as what Git calls remotes. Uh, the command is git remote add nickname remote URL. Um, and that remote URL uh, can be a lot of things. It can be using a bunch of different transport protocols. It can be something local on your machine. Uh, it can be using SSH, rsync, the Git protocol, HTTP, HTTPS, right? That's why GitHub gives you five or six possible URLs that you can clone. Um, when you copy a repo, or I should say clone it using the git clone command, you'll, you'll automatically have a remote called origin. Git automatically... Um, takes the repository that you've cloned and names it origin. Uh, there's nothing magical. There's nothing really special about that word. Um, you know, you could name it something else. Uh, so when you're done working, you push your work up to a remote repository. So git push a remote nickname, whether it's origin or something else, and then the branch that you want to push. Usually this is git push origin master or git push origin develop or whatever your working branch is that you want to go share. Um, but if someone else has pushed work to that branch on the repo, that is to say if the repo has commits that you don't have, uh, it will kick out an error and not let you do it. Git tries to keep you from being, uh, 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 from being dumb. Um, one word of warning about this. Once it goes up to the public, it's public, or it's public at least within your organization or within whoever has access to this Git repo. If it's GitHub, it's probably the world, right? Don't commit your passwords.txt file into the repo and push that. Uh, uh, Randall says that the number one question they get, they, they get <laughs> on uh, the Git IRC channel is, I put my bank account number into my Git repo and I pushed it live to the world what do I do? The answer is nothing. The answer is get a new bank. 
get a new bank account, right? Once it goes up, once it goes up there, it is part of, like they always threatened you in high school, this is part of your permanent record. Yeah? Um, now, if someone else has done some work on master and pushed it up, and the, uh, the remote master branch is ahead of, of where you, you, your, your local repository thinks the remote master branch is, Git won't let you commit. So what you can do uh, is you can fetch that work from the server. The command is git fetch, for example, git fetch origin to fetch from you know, the repo you uh, originally cloned. Um, remote branches are tracked locally, so you can check out a remote branch. You can't commit on top of it because it's not something really that exists on your computer, but uh, uh, you can create a branch that is at the same place as the remote branch, I guess. But so, uh, you know, the origins master branch will be origin master locally, and this is very fast and very high level, but, um, uh, uh, but those remote branches, you can examine them. You can check them out and examine the state of the code base. You can refer to them. You can calculate diffs. And crucially, you can merge them uh, into your own work. So say we want to get push, put, get push origin master. Uh, say you want to get push origin master. Uh, and you get an error message because someone else has um, someone else has worked. Well, we're on the master branch, so we're going to get fetch origin. We're going to get merge origin master into our uh, into our master and git push master and that command will succeed. You may have created a parallel history there. You may want to rebase your branch on top of origin master, uh, but you know, you can merge origin master somehow into your, into your own work um, and go. Yeah, I would actually prefer a rebase from someone working with me at that point. Okay, we are at the point where we should stop so let me ask if there are closing questions uh, at this point. <laughs> Let's just go across. Go for it. Do I use Git GUI? Um, I use a visual, yeah, repo visualization is for whatever reason important to me. It really helps me understand the state of the history. The one that I use on Mac is called Wish. Uh, yeah, there's one called Source Tree also that's very good. The git k library, G-I-T-K, uh, or git t-k if you want, uh, is, is also fine. It'll show you the state of your repository, but it's a little more basic. Is there a hand before? Yeah. Yes. You probably don't want to go back. Once you've merged that work in, you probably don't need to go back to the state of the world at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if that's something that's important to you, uh, then don't delete it. You can leave it there. There's no harm in leaving it there. But if you're not going to use it anymore, go ahead and delete it. Yeah, and Git log will, will show you all of those. Over here? Yeah. So, um, on your development environment, you're calling uh, your production code the master. Sure. On the repository, is it just origin? Or like, is it is the main repository, is it just like one straight branch? Or, like, is, like are there forks? It depends. If you push branches with forks to the main repository, the main repository will have branches with forks. If you only push branches with a serial history, then the main the main repository will be uh, will will be uh, have a serial history. Will be straight. How do you identify what when? Uh huh. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, so the question is, how do you identify what the what the what the common point of origin that everyone is working for? Yeah. So uh, you get an email, right? A lot, a lot of the time, or you, yeah, you get it. You get an IM uh, from your integration manager or something like that, or from your team. I, I work next to a guy sometimes, and I just IM him. Hey, pull down, uh, pull down origin because I've put some work on the develop branch, and you need to to rebase on top of it to incorporate it into. Uh, into your work, but it requires coordination and communication among people, among the team. So the team will have a Git workflow and probably a Git integration manager if it's a medium to large team, uh, and that person will establish the best practices for doing for doing that kind of thing. One more, and then let's get out of here so you can do your next session. Yeah. Uh, if you're 
Uh huh. Uh, git init, and that will create. It would if we had a, a two-hour session for a demo. I would have done it, uh, but I think we got a wrap. But git init in an empty directory will initialize that directory as a repository. You can start adding source code files to it. Git add, git commit, and you're off to the races. All right. I hope this was useful, guys. Have a great Drupal cram. Talk to you later.